things meeting um, because Item one in the agenda is welcome and apologies for absence. So I'd like to forward the live stream. So please, can you keep your microphones on mute throughout the meeting? Because this will help present audio feedback of which I've already had a little bit. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand to get my attention. Um, for those online, the chat function must not be used to have conversations with other participants or to provide personal information. All the chat is recorded as this is a formal meeting. Please only use it to alert me to the fact that you wish to speak or to raise points um, or to report tech problems and officers will be on hand to assist you. Um, please note that the press may be in attendance virtually and the right of the press and public to record and film the meeting will apply. Um, in terms of online members, I think everybody is here. Yes, fabulous. So there's no apologies. Oh, except for Councillor Young, who is intend attending a resident engagement meeting. Are there any urgent items? No, thank you. Agenda item three, declarations of interest. Does anybody have any interest they'd like? To regeneration schemes. State regeneration, as we know, can offer ex existing tenants and leaseholders better homes newer homes and the heart of proposals for regeneration on their estates ambitious estate regeneration projects which are at very strategy and from residents living in council managed estates that have been affected by estate regeneration schemes this has helped us understand their experience of resident engagement and what they may like to see happen additionally or differently in the future the key insights from this exercise can be found in the supplementary agenda pack, which I hope everybody will have received. Yes, thank you. We will also be assisted today by Paul Watt, Professor of Urban Studies at Birkbeck University. There was extensive research and experience into the impact experiences. Um, at any Councillor Guy Nicholson, Deputy Mayor and Cabinet Member for and Hermione Brightwell, Project Manager for Whoopi Down Regeneration Online. External guests, as I said already, Paul Watts, Professor Paul Watts of Urban Studies Birkbeck University. Nice to meet you. I'd like to welcome you all formally to this meeting. Firstly, I'd like to invite Deputy Mayor Nicholson and Rachel Bagelor to give a presentation to supplement the written submission received in advance of the meeting. 
please can you get a brief synopsis of the executive um, report submitted and you'll have up to 10 minutes for your presentation and at eight minutes i will advise you you've got two minutes left thank you very much uh, great thank you chair and I, I i'll i will keep to a very very brief and tight kind of introduction so that there's plenty of time um for rachel to get through her 10 minutes and then for everyone just to have as much time as possible to discuss after the presentation but just to kind of sort of say that i think what rachel is going to be presenting to us this evening is sort of it has to be seen as a culmination of over 10 years worth of experience in uh, building relationships with residents around a state-based regeneration led by the council um, and it is by no means to sort of say that it can't be enhanced or improved going forward but i think that um, i hope anyway what does sort of come across is something that is a pretty good basis and foundation from which to kind of reflect about where we might want to take that kind of um, uh, relationship building and engagement um, forward into the future. Um, the, um, uh, the other reflection is, is that I think as you know, uh, I know many colleagues in the room are aware, um, you know, we made a very, very clear political commitment in the, our local elections last May about tenant engagement, resident engagement and participation. Um, not just it's true in the regeneration processes in and around the borough, whether it be a state based or town centre based, but of course that uh, relationship building and participation across the wider reach of council led activities um, in our communities. But, um, uh, but then, as you said this evening, the focus is very much on those residents who uh, one way or another are linked to the council and the homes that are owned and run by the council. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Brilliant. I'm the strategic head of housing regeneration and delivery at Hackney Council and I um, oversee all of generation projects like Colville to small of the programme. Um, so, as Council Hundred new um, homes um, across 30 sites, um, mostly direct delivery, but there are also partnership um, uh, schemes such as Woodbury Down. We've nearly built, we've nearly started, completed or received planning permission for nearly 2,000 new homes. Um, and as I said, it's a sort of big range of different kinds of building projects ranging from um, estate region to um, building on what we call brownfield land or um, mainly sort of garage sites um, within estates on HRA land. Um, and we're building a mix of tenure, but um, with focus on social rent, um, some shared ownership and some Hackney living rent. And we build um, outright sale homes to pay for it all, um, given the lack of government funding. Um, and as Deputy Mayor said, we've um, the new manifesto, we've committed to um, building a thousand new um, council homes by 2026. Next slide, please. Um, so these are um, our commitments um, to residents. Um, so first of all, we're not for profit. So we're building homes um, to build, every home that we build for outright sale is to pay for social housing. And that's a fundamental principle of our programme. Um, secondly, it's council led, so we're not selling off land to private developers. Um, we're doing it ourselves on council land and we, we keep the land um, in, into the future. Um, we make the most of the land that we have available, so um, we are sort of proactive in finding sites to build on. Um, given the acute nature of the housing crisis we have here in Hackney, we're, looking, we're leaving no stone unturned in finding land to build on. 
Um, we have a clear first dibs policy for local people, so that includes a right to return for people whose homes have been demolished through the process um, onto the estate in which they lived, and a local lettings policy for people affected by um, what we're building um, to have um, a right to have one of the new homes. Um, and a huge principle is that we want to work with local residents throughout the process. Um, we want um, to work with them right from the beginning um, and involve them um, fully. Next slide, please. So we have some um, consultation principles which are set out um, in the residence charter. Um, and here are some of them. Um, so timely, so that means that we don't rush the process. We don't want um, the design process to be rushed so that residents can't get um, properly involved. And we um, try to get people involved in the process as early as possible. Um, and make sure that they're involved at key stages throughout. We want it to be meaningful, and that means that we're not just doing it for the sake of it. So we want to make sure that where possible, we can incorporate fee feedback that residents give or their views that are taken into account. And where we can, we will change schemes in response. And when we can't, we're really clear about where, where we can't and why we can't. Um, we want to, um, our consultation to be inclusive um, and we go to great lengths to um, reach underrepresented groups and make sure that all voices are heard and it's not just the loudest voices that um, that we listen to. Um, working directly with residents, you know, we have our, um, you know, project um, teams are on the ground at consultation events like this picture and um, we don't sort of outsource our consultation. It's very much us out there um, uh, at, at events and, and talking to residents and collaborative and that's about giving um trying to give uh, people a sort of leading role in the process so that it doesn't feel like people are having this done to them um next slide please so i've got a couple of case studies um colville um we've been involved in um, working with residents on colville for over 10 years now i think it's more like 15 years um and um sort of part way through the regeneration um huge history of working with um residents and particularly the resident steering group um and there are monthly meetings um and we attend those um and are very much sort of involved in uh in in the community there um residents have access to an independent tenant and leaseholder advisor who gives impartial support and advice um to individual residents um and they can also be part of the regeneration steering group um and residents who are going to get one of the new homes that we build um, are involved in the actual design of their homes. So um, they influence the layouts of homes, what kind of windows they have, the kind of the design of things like balconies. Um, and there are, this is through sort of workshops with the design teams and um, exhibitions. Um, and you know, it's a sort of hugely involved process. Um, and then statewide, there is. Um, extensive um, engagement and um, consultation on the design of the public realm and the landscape proposals because on Colville we're doing quite significant changes sort of transformative public realm work so new streets new spaces new play areas next slide um, the next case study is de Beauvoir um, this is different from Colville in that we're building we're not knocking any homes down we're knocking a few, small number but Broadly speaking, we're building on um, uh, uh, pieces of unused land, so it's sort of infilling um, areas. Um, so it's new homes amongst existing homes. Um, and um, we've done, we've also been working on De Beauvoir for over five years now. Um, we, before COVID, we had um, a sort of big programme of in person consultations. Um, with a resident steering group, we did workshops. We we did, we do the door knocking, and we do this on lots of our projects where to try and drum up engagement and interest and involvement. We um, rather than just sending out leaflets and putting posters up, we go staff in our team go and knock on doors and invite um, involvement. Um, so it's sort of proactive, and we did particular workshops with young people on the estate as well. Um, during lockdown, we had to change the way we worked. Um, and we did online consultation events. And then we also set up a dedicated phone line for consultation for people who didn't feel comfortable using um, 
the internet or didn't want to do online. Um, we also did lots of, we do printed material and we also do e-newsletters. Um, e um, two minutes. Two minutes, I've got a bit of a rush then. Um, and also we have an independent tenant leaseholder advisor on the for as well. And then not, another case study is the um, new homes program. So this is what uh, with cabinet approval uh, just before Christmas for um, building um, on 50 new council sites, um, repurposing land um, for garage sites. Um, and this uh, program will be 75% social rent. Um, and we're working, we work on this program of new sites. We've worked really early in the process. We've actually learned from previous um, schemes um, and we're bringing our, our engagement right to the beginning before we've even appointed a design team, before we've even got going on the design to inform the brief for the design team to inform how we appoint a design team. Um, and there was a huge amount of engagement before even the cabinet report was um, put together to, for that programme. Um, and, and there will be ongoing engagement um, throughout the design process when that starts. And then finally, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Hermione and the Woodbury Down team, who's going to very briefly tell us about Woodbury Down. Hi, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Am I, um... Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, so Woodbury Down is, is delivered slightly differently, as Rachel was saying. It's um, being actually delivered by Barclay Homes. And we are in a, the council is in a formal partnership with Barclay Homes as well as Notting Hill Genesis. Um, and in that, we also have um, the Woodbury Down Community Organisation, who are representative residents community organisation, and they are formally partners on the regeneration. So Woodco, as they're known for short, are involved in all um, aspects of bringing forward the regeneration and kind of right all the way through from kind of really early design stages all the way through to kind of ongoing management issues. Um, there's many ways in which, um, you know, we have policies and processes to kind of really um, embed to make sure that we work effectively with the community and things like, and, you know, we're obviously committed to providing a new home. Everyone who lives in Woodbury Down, it's a key aim of the council and of the regeneration that no one ever has to leave Woodbury Down. We want to um, encourage the existing community to stay and through the, the phased regeneration, that means that there's never any, um, all the moves are planned and there's never any need for any kind of um, intermediate moves. So we're actually at the moment going through a process of allocating new homes to residents who are on the next phase of the regeneration and we have already allocated homes to nearly all of the existing council tenants in phase three sorry in phase four on the new homes into new homes in phase three um which will be ready in 2024 so it's quite a good lead in time and um you know plenty of time to work with people in a similar way, we're working with leaseholders and we offer people shared equity so that nobody has to leave the estate if they don't want to. Um, and then in terms of the actual community engagement, Woodco are involved, as I said, we have a formal partnership agreement with Woodco. We have an away day every year where all of the development partners, including Woodco, go away together. And um, coming out of that, we have a shared action plan. We have a partnership agreement, which we all um, you know, agree to all the objectives and the principles in that. And then we're co uh, involved in um, many aspects of the kind of practical day-to-day -day elements of bringing forward the regeneration. Um, in particular, we have a design committee and that has, it meets at the moment every fortnight. Um, it's looking at all the, it has been looking at all the new designs for the next phase of the regeneration in detail and um, we're just moving into looking at a new master plan for Woodbury Down and the design committee has six members of um, the Woodbury Down community organisation who have been elected by the wider group to um, to be on that um, that committee and so kind of all of the details of all of the um, new aspects of the regeneration are kind of are really scrutinised and discussed and that's also a good forum for discussing more um you know challenging issues or where as rachel was saying it's um where there are issues around viability or we can't obviously always do exactly what um residents might like to see so it's a really good forum for being able to have a two-way discussion and um you know and, and and find understanding and make sure people um can understand where we're coming from um and 
yeah, so there's a lot of, um, we're kind of very embedded in the day to day aspects of the regeneration. And even when we're taking something out to consultation, that's we've already discussed um, all of the aspects with that group so that there's a kind of agreement about what's then going to be presented to the wider community. And um, as we said at the beginning, Councillor Young is actually at the monthly Woodco board meeting, which is Woodco's own meeting but which development partners also um, attend so there's many forums where we engage with Woodco proactively or on thank, you. Down. thank you Hermione we have to round that up there on just over your 10 minutes thank you though um, obviously there will be questions followed up later on um, I'd now like to invite Professor Paul Watt to give a presentation you will have up to 10 minutes and after which we'll take questions across the board for all um, presenters this evening. Hi. Uh, could you put the slide up, please? Thanks. Okay. Just say, uh, yeah, I'm Professor Urban Studies at uh, Birkbeck, and uh, one of my areas of research is housing and regeneration. I published a book a couple of years ago. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, the book starts with this quotation. Because regeneration, you know, in many ways, is counterintuitive because regeneration is automatically thought to be a good thing. But um, many residents that I spoke to thought regeneration was problematic in all kinds of ways. Next slide, please. So I looked at a series of uh, mainly looked at 14 regener uh, regeneration estates across seven London boroughs, including Woodbury Down in Hackney. So next slide, please. The visual discourse on state regeneration, particularly state demolition, is that basically there are no there are no losers. This is essentially a fairly problematic process in which um, you know everybody everybody gets a prize essentially. Um, that's largely untrue because there are significant problems that the official discourse doesn't really discuss. Next slide, please. Okay, so I would argue that thinking about regeneration strategies, demolition rebuild is at one extreme of the possible regeneration strategy. You can obviously have a refurbishment at the other extreme, you can also have infilling. I would argue that um, thinking about demolition rebuild, that should be the last regeneration option, partly because of the extended period of time involved, the complexity of the process, the expense. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, all right. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, the expense, disruption to the existing community, displacement effects, the gentrification effects, the negative environmental effects. So I would argue that refurbishment and possibly infills should be preferable alternatives. So next slide, please. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about two aspects of my research. First is about the consultation process, and secondly is about the experience then, of temporary tenants living in the states that are undergoing regeneration. Okay, in terms of consultation, what you've got is really, at the beginning of the process, you're actually beginning from a position, I'm talking about tenants on the state, in which there's a good deal of inbuilt cynicism before any regeneration plans are provided. Why? Because they've already had years and years of complaining about their housing conditions to either the council or the housing association and not got things done. So there's an inbuilt distrust of the process to begin with. Uh, so next slide, please. And that just is some quotes then from the housing association in Hackney, which illustrates that. Basically, then people saying rather than regenerate with all the promises and with flutes, bells, and whistles, people wanted to have the existing uh, structures improved and maintained. Uh, next slide, please. Secondly, what I mean here is that there's a, what you can call a value gap. There's often a gap between consultants and residents in terms of what they think is valuable and what's not valuable. And essentially, it's the difference between an outsider and an insider perspective. So there you've got on the left-hand side, the regeneration consultant, then talking about a uh, deprived, rough place. And then you've got uh, an estate resident uh, from the Aylesbury estate, one of the estates that I looked at, basically then saying, you know, despite the fact that this estate was labelled as the estate from hell, as it was, um, nevertheless, that didn't chime in many ways 
with the ways that the residents experienced itself. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've taken the next little bit from consultation that was uh, at the Northumberland Park Estate, which was part of the Harringay Development Vehicle. So next slide, please. Okay, so these were some of the statements that the consultants gave to the residents. So for example, then you've got um, Northumberland Park should be made up should be made up of attractive places with a range of different buildings and open spaces. Eight to six percent agree. Well, it's hardly unsurprising that people are going to agree with that sort of statement because it's actually impossible to disagree with it. But it was those kinds of statements which were actually used by the consultants to argue that the Northumberland Park Estate residents wanted to have comprehensive redevelopment. In other words, that they wanted their estate to be demolished and knocked down. What was very difficult to find in the report, next slide, yeah, it's Chris. Is the missing the D word? It was often buried in the appendices of various consultation reports. It wasn't so. In other words, the opportunity cost of what would what would it mean to get all of these bright new things wasn't actually spelled out. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's a quote. Next slide, please. So residents' concerns then that the regeneration names were typically unclear. There was a lack of detailed information. Complaints about the meetings not being held at convenient times. The consultation format itself was unclear. Some people said that consultation, if you thought, was a rubber stamping exercise, that essentially the decision had already been made. Plus, there was a turnover then of official regeneration personnel, the officers and the councillors. So, yeah, next slide, please. Just again, just one of these, just a quote, couple of quotes then. People saying then they weren't clear what was the point of actually doing the regeneration of this particular estate. Next slide, please. And this is a quote then from one of the estates I looked at in Lambeth. And here then, and this wasn't unusual at all, here you had people then going along to what turned out to be consultation events, but it wasn't really clear what the whole purpose of the event was at the beginning. Next slide, please. And this then illustrates, again, at one of the Lamberson states I looked at, is the way then that the officers come and go. And again, you have to remember that, and again, let's just take Woodbury Down. The regeneration at Woodbury Down actually began with an SRB project back in 1999. Last year, it's an eight phase program. It's not going to be completed until 2035. So there's a throughput of officers. So the only people who are there at the end of the process are the residents, basically. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Right, so we'll be down, I have to say, of the estates that I did look at in terms of consultation. That was one of the estates then whereby it was genuinely, people did feel that they made a, a serious positive input into the process. A quote there from one of the uh, tenants. Um, also then, you had an independent residence advisor there. And there's also, quite importantly, there's a dedicated office. And I think all of those factors were quite important in creating that sort of sense of engagement and involvement. Next slide, please. Okay, I looked at temporary tenants there, three estates will be down, standing in Barnet, Copper Park, and Lambeth. So the problems that they faced were these. Firstly, poor housing conditions when they moved in. Secondly, very diff great difficulty they had in getting repairs and maintenance done. Thirdly, a lack of knowledge about the existing area. Fourthly, was difficulty in social integration, leading to social isolation. Fifthly, was amongst any existing pre uh, long term residents, tenants, etc., there was a sense of anonymity as the new faces were moving in, they didn't know who they were. Sixthly, there's a lack of clarity for the temporary tenants regarding how long they might be there and their rehousing status. And then sixth, then, something I call displacement anxiety, people worried about what was going to happen to them. And last then, those people who are, were actually moved off, this particularly the case at West Henry and Clapham Park, that the whole process was dehumanising. I just, I probably don't have time to illustrate all of those, but if you just move a couple slides on. Yeah, that one. Yeah, it was correct, please. Okay, so this then was a temporary tenant's bathroom at West Hendon. The tiles fell off and he couldn't simply get the council to repair them. Why? Because they were on the regen, basically. And this was a familiar lament that many of the tenants were saying. It's difficult to get stuff done because they're on the regen. 
And this seemed to be a particular problem that temporary tenants had as states, as opposed to the insecure council tenants. Okay, I'll move forward, I'm running out of time. So go forward to consultation uh, suggestions. Yep, next one. Yeah, move on, please. Yeah, move on. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put some consultation suggestions then. Firstly, is importantly about you know, building or rebuilding trust by regular efficient maintenance services, efficient services. It's very difficult to kind of like to, to plonk the regeneration scheme onto an estate whereby you've already got pre existing tenant dissatisfaction with the existing repairs and maintenance service. That should be really addressed before any regeneration schemes are touted. Secondly, be humble, acknowledge that you're outsiders with partial and possibly even stereotypical perceptions of the states. Thirdly, appreciate that you're dealing with people's homes and communities. Fourthly, move away from uh, consulting residents to actually treating them as experts. Uh, and that is something then which takes time. Good consultation does take a lot of time. Fifthly, support consultation support where they, where they seem to be working, for example, Woodco. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Six, I think this is really important because I think that what tends to happen with the regeneration is that councils and housing associations, they have to sell regeneration to the tenants. So what they do is typically, as with selling, they oversell it, basically. And they don't, they don't really articulate what are the benefits, who's going to benefit, and what are the potential disbenefits of this, because there are potential disbenefits. So, sixthly, have clarity regarding the purpose of regeneration, specify what the aims and the potential benefits will be, and for whom. Whom exactly is going to benefit from this process? Seventh, be realistic. Do not present a one-sided, everything's going to be better, we'll all sail off into Alice in Wonderland world. That's not the way it is. It really isn't in regeneration terms. It's a very bruising process in many ways, particularly if it involves demolition and rebuild. They acknowledge the potential problems that regeneration and housing, housing will give rise to. There will be disruption. There is stressful processes. Regeneration, and again, particularly if it involves demolition and rebuild, will take years to come to fruition. And highly likely the regeneration aims and the program itself will change throughout the process so professor what if i could ask you to wind up please sure thank yep, you that's the next slide that's it okay so suggestions regarding temporary tenants ensure the temporary tenants properties are in genuinely decent standard provide funding to assist with fixtures and fittings take practice steps to socially integrate temporary tenants into estates so you could have some sort of welcome pack active liaison between existing community facilities staff and temporary tenants uh, fourth, ensure timely and effective repairs and maintenance, clarify and update rehousing status, and improve rehousing and financial compensation rights along the lines of secure tenants. Just on the last slide, because the penalties of not doing this properly are quite severe. One is, the if you look at the Kerr's Lake report, which has just been done about Lambeth regeneration, you can see, clearly see that, you know, you can hardly say that Lambeth Council have been uh, are fantastically effective in terms of their uh, state regeneration program. And then, obviously, the worst case example, obviously, is Grenfell, whereby the TMO, of course, didn't actually really listen to the residents. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Watts. Very insightful. Um, now I'd like to open up the floor to Commission members and any questions I'd like to put forward in respect of anything they've heard this evening. Oh, sorry, I should also introduce Steve Webster, um, the Chair of Hackney's Resident Liaison Group, who's online with us. Did you want to put a question forward immediately? Yes, if I could. Um, okay. The first question is, is the point has been made in one of the reports which was circulated and during both presentations that um, some residents have feedback that they feel that the process is the consultation and discussions are tokenistic, their views are not being taken on board. And, you know, really, what is the point that, you know, this is a downstream process, what is the point? I'm interested in what measures um, the presenters have in place to sort of challenge that 
um, perception of residents and um, what what do they actually do to demonstrate to residents that their views have been taken on board and for, for Pro Professor Watts um, I agree with um, with the point he made um, from his research that um, re residents um, who live on this state, we are the experts. We know what happened on the state. We know where there are um, antisocial and criminal hotspots on our estates where the CCV TV doesn't cover, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? Um, I just wonder if the professor has got any good um, practical strategies that um, council staff can take on board to incorporate that and, and you know a cultural change within staff to take that on board that we are not sitting on the states waiting for professionals to come and top us up but we actually have some value to add to the agenda as well thank you thank you chair thank you steve should we take hackney first don't know who wants response rachel thank you Thank you. Sorry, I'll start again. Um, so in answer to that first question, um, there's, I'll just talk about two things that we do. Um, the first one is that we um, try to be clear at the beginning about what residents can influence and what they can't um, and be honest about that. So, for instance, we aren't having the, you know, the need for affordable housing is acute. We're not we, we need, if there's a piece of land we need to build on, we, you know, when we've made that decision, it's going to happen. But residents have a clear remit of um, being able to influence um, the design of the scheme, the design of the public areas, the communal spaces, the, in, you know, the layout of the flats, if they're going to get one of the new flats. So we want to be very clear from the outset what they can influence, what they can't. Um, and then secondly, um, we, we have a sort of you said we did um, way of communicating after we've done consultation and that's very clear in the material we produce so um, every time we have a um, an engagement event and we gather feedback we then um, try to incorporate as much as we possibly can into into the design and change the design of the scheme in response and we're clear to residents in the next consultation um, or engagement session or the next steering group meeting or in a newsletter we clearly set out what they said and then we say what we did in response where and, and if we didn't change the design to respond to that we say why so that there's a clear it, it, so they don't feel like what they're saying isn't being listened to and um, but we have to be honest that we're not going to be able to change everything that we can't respond to every single thing that a resident wants to change but we try our best to do to, to do that and we have made really significant changes to designs over the years um, in response to resident feedback it's ge genuinely is not not tokenistic so that's that's my answer did you want to add anything go ahead thanks, for that. Sorry. Oh, thanks. Thanks. thanks chair i mean j j just to add to that i think the principle of co-production which is something that paul you too were describing um is something that is really very very important and very relevant and i think the council over the course of the last sort of few years has moved quite considerably in that direction in a very meaningful way and um, that that idea of co-production is also pretty firmly set into the future as well um so there is no intention to in effect encourage the council to back away from that building that kind of relationship but I think that the, the, the points that have been well made already this evening and through the presentations has been the real kind of requirement of resource, patience, time that has to be committed to um, from the institutions um, to, to actually bring that forward. And if I may say that actually the Woodbury Down dynamic, um, that what has been instrumental in ensuring that residents aren't being left behind in that very very long-term scheme um, is the fact that the council's there continually pursuing all of those various different actors who are involved in that particular project um, uh, to to ensure that residents are not left behind that they are part of the process 
And I think that's a very commendable thing. Um, I mean, we can argue the rights and wrongs about whether a commercial developer should be taking more of a role, of more of a responsibility, and so on and so forth, and call on them to commit more resource or more time or whatever. But the principle that actually the council is one of the main social actors within such a relationship is there making sure that that um, relationship is strengthened, enhanced, and built upon, I think is a good one. Um, and I think it's absolutely appropriate, I'd suggest, Chair, that that's exactly what the Council should be doing um, in that kind of situation. Meanwhile, on those projects where it is that kind of main, not just um, developer, but also um, that landlord, the relationship should go even deeper that and I think that, that that certainly is where the housing regeneration team within the council have certainly started to take it and I think Rachel you touched upon it in the presentation where yeah. what we're talking about now and the Beauvoir estate is probably a very good example of this currently um, is a far deeper and more sensitive relationship around co-production thanks Jeff. Thank you. So for you, we've just got Hermione who'd like to jump in. So apologies, Professor Watts, if that's okay. No? Yeah, and just say that, uh, yeah, the whole principle of co production is uh, uh, it's good, uh, uh, a good principle. Um, I think, importantly, the impression I get from looking at the consultations that I did look at, the, the principle is time, spending time at these estates, not coming in with a pre-existing set of ideas and plans as to what exactly you're going to do, but actually trying to develop more of a genuine bottom-up approach as to what you think the potential problems are and what could be done about them. But again, be realistic in terms of like what is achievable and what's not achievable. And again, you know, illustrate the costs and benefits throughout and the different strategies that you can adopt. Thank you, Professor Watt. Hermione, did you want to come in? I was just going to say briefly that in Woodbury Down, certainly the. Um, we. Well, it's a little low, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that I think the, the involvement of the residents in so many different ways, we've got numerous working groups, um, as well as the design committee, and then as you know, beyond after things have been built um, through um, things like liaison on kind of housing management issues and so on. And we've certainly seen kind of really direct influence from the residents all the way through from like really quite big strategic issues. There's been a lot of influence from residents and things like bringing forward. We've got a new community space coming forward and things like the Woodbury wetlands being reopened. That's all been kind of like very directly influenced from discussion with residents and all the way through to kind of um, looking at detailed designs on new homes and things like, you know, where um, sockets are positioned and you know balconies and all sorts of things like that as well as in kind of public realm schemes so um and similarly to rachel there's also a principle of being able to illustrate back through consultation um how what people have said has fed into the designs that are coming forward thank you thank you chair Thank you. Before I call Councillor Palace, can I just kind of quickly jump in it in respect of that kind of ongoing or co-production with um, residents and tenants? I think after hearing from um, representatives from Woodbury Down, it was quite clear that there were elements of good practice that they had managed to embed in conjunction with the councillor councils. And I think there was a call for a, a universal approach which took, took on board the experience of that they'd had. Uh, I think one particular area was, was in a call, it was in respect of split households and policies relating to that. So they'd fought for accommodation for older um, children who at the time were potentially in their teens. Um, whereas, and there was agreement in terms of them being able to return to their own accommodation post development, which wasn't necessarily reflected in conversations with some current or other areas of development um, across the borough. So taking on board those experiences of Woodbury Down, how likely are we to see that good practice embedded more widely and on a, well, on a universal basis without tenants and residents having to kind of advocate for it strongly? Um, I would say that Woodbury Down um, is not the only example across our uh, programme of um, 
best practice. I think we've got um, lots of other um, examples of um, estate regeneration projects where we have that level of engagement. Um, obviously, Woodbury Down is the biggest of the sort of uh, programs and the lengthiest in terms of the time frame. I mean, it's over 20 years, so that it is going to be, I guess, by the nature of that, more involved than a um, than some of our other projects. And you know, some of our projects are maybe take a few years, and uh, they just want, for instance, one building um, within an estate on one site. So, big range of different types of um, schemes that we're working on. But I would say, um, on our, we've got a number of estate regen projects. Um, that we're delivering directly where we have a similar approach to um, engagement and co-production. Um, we have steering groups that are very, um, resident steering groups that are very involved in the process. Um, we do a huge range of um, events and um, different forums for engagement, um, ranging from, I mentioned, trying to get people involved through door knocking, but also um, we have um, workshop design workshops, we have um, fun days for residents to get people out and involved we have um, uh, newsletters that go out on a regular basis to the whole estate um, and just a huge range of ways of um, involving residents in in the process of regeneration I mean being specific uh, yeah I'm be more specific now yeah. in terms of this approach to split households of course each development has a different time framing which you know which is going to be undertaken but for, for those that are kind of similar in terms of replicating maybe five years or so would that kind of approach be incorporated into the workings of the scheme or would it you know be accepted as a good policy and want to kind of immediately embed as opposed to having to it having yeah. having, having to be a call for action because we, we felt it was good practice when we heard it we thought that was marvelous it's a marvelous approach and others felt likewise and it wasn't applicable in their estate so yeah longer 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 term projects so learning the lessons from other projects of a similar nature and ensuring that they're embedded is that something that we're committed to doing yeah I, are you talking specifically about the local lettings policy and there's a particular there's a specific one for Woodbury down um and then there's a general one that is to cover all of, all of the borough is that what you're getting at it's, uh, I mean, it's, do you know it could be, that's that was a key one that was highlighted yeah. in the focus group which okay. other attendees felt was a really really good approach and were just kind of concerned that it didn't apply to their own estate Colvin was one um, in question again it was a, a longer term project been some time in the making and stops and starts but they felt that that, that kind of approach hadn't been discussed to them and they felt it would be beneficial there was yeah. a woman with a child who was 16 and by the time her estate, the, the element of regeneration had been finished, that child would be eligible for a home, but that wasn't a factor in terms of the conversations that were being yeah. had. So, yeah. That question I might have to come back to with a written response because that relates to our housing and strategy and policy colleagues. And there is a local lettings policy that is was um, adopted by cabinet um, last March, which covers the whole borough, but there was a, a bespoke one for Woodbury Down, and there is one being reviewed for Colville at the moment. So I'll, I can come back to you on that question. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Councillor Palace and then Councillor Joseph. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, so this is uh, for Rachel, um, and thank you so much for your comprehensive report and to hear, you know, the good practice which is happening in Hackney. Um, it's in relation to the Mayor of London's Better Homes for Local People report. I was just wondering, how have we taken on the guidance um, and how are we measuring the, the impact of, of what we're doing in kind of in terms of following um, that that guidance um, and making sure it's making a real um, difference. And then to Councillor Nicholson and to Professor Watt, um, could you just kind of outline what you see as the cost of not uh, building new social homes and and the effect that that has upon um, communities, um, as we've heard in this meeting time and time again we have 8,000 people on our housing waiting list we've got 3,100 people in temporary accommodation uh, professor what has given us a very eloquent um, account of what he um, has uh, kind of outlined in his in his research and he talks about refurbishment being an alternative um, but in a time of austerity in a time when we don't have rent control um what's the cost of not building social housing in a borough like hackney 
I'll go first. Um, yes, we are um, in line with the mayor's guidance on um, resident engagement. Um, I can say that um, that, that um, what we, the way that we um, conduct our resident engagement and the way we conduct estate regeneration is in line with with that guide. And what? Sorry, what was the second question? How we're kind of measuring the impact of kind of you know implementing that guidance and and um, mm. in terms of. Uh, you know, we often uh, are drawing upon GLA money sometimes to cross subsidise. Yeah. Um, you know, what what report backs uh, are, are we doing? How are we kind of measuring the impact of of, of following that guidance? But also, uh, you know, the measurement in in general, kind of how how we kind of measure the impact of what we're we're doing. That's a very big question and a very good question, and it's something that we do a lot. We've been doing a lot of thinking about, um, and um, we. So, when you're working on an estate like um, Colville, where you've been working there for over ten years, um, and it's a really long-term regeneration project, the question is, how do we measure the success of that project and the the, inf the impact of it on people's lives, um, and it's a really complex thing to do and it's something we're trying to tackle at the moment because um, it's not just about sending out surveys to residents when they move into their new home and sort of resident satisfaction survey about whether they like their new home or not it's a much bigger thing than that it's about what are the actual long-term outcomes of the regeneration in terms of um, things like um, opportunity for people um, health and well-being benefits of having good quality housing and good quality open spaces um, you know, all of those bigger benefits that are really hard to measure, but really important. Um, and I haven't, I can be honest and say we haven't cracked it, but it's something we really want to do. Um, because we, we've piled some post-occupancy evaluation on King's Crescent, but it's very much more about the immediate sort of, um, popularity of the new homes, plus the, you know, performance of them in terms of their sustainability and their energy efficiency and those kind of things, so building performance. But what that isn't measuring is, like, have we created a better place that has that has made it, you know, improve people's lives? And that is a that is something that I really want us to be able to do better. But it's um, not an easy one to crack. But yeah, it's one we want to focus on. Professor Watt. Thank you. Um, well, obviously, um, you know, clearly, London, I mean, London's a car crash in terms of housing, obviously. Basically, it's a 40 year catastrophe. That's what's happened. Essentially, London hasn't built enough social homes for the last 40 years. Uh, it's sold off huge tranches through the right to buy. Um, you know, so we start from a really, really terrible baseline. But um, if, you know, obviously in terms of costs, in terms of people in terms of accommodation, people in terms of overcrowding, it's obviously horrendous for people. However, I would argue that if, if the only way that a council or housing association says that it can provide more social homes is to demolish existing estates, I think that's, that's deeply problematic. I think there have to be alternative ways of thinking about that because the costs of demolition and rebuild are also very substantial in terms of the impacts it has on people. One of the points to make in the book is that if you look at um, if you look at the health costs to the demolition and rebuild, none of those ever appear in the councils or the housing associations or the developers' balance sheets. The costs, the health costs, the negative health costs are actually borne by the NHS. But that won't appear in, in any in any of anybody else's balance sheets. So yes, but obviously London needs more social housing, but not necessarily at the expense of demolishing existing social rental homes. Professor Watt, would you be able to outline what you see as the alternatives? Oh, infill. If you want to build more homes, then infill on different, you know, if that's, that's what we need to do, then infill on existing estates, provided that there's, you know, you know, it will be empty garage space or what have you. Or, or, you know, any other land that you've got, basically, do a land audit. I, I, I've not studied Hackney's land audit, so I don't know what, what land you've got available. But, um, you know, demolishing an, an existing estate should, as I said, I think it should be the last, very last option. Councillor Nicholson. 
Sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. And just to kind of respond to the same question that Councillor Pallas just tabled. Um, I, I mean, I think perhaps sort of just reflecting some of Paul's comments that have just been made. I think we're all aware, as um, you know, as ward councillors, of some of the real, real life struggles that, um, um, unfortunately, numbers of residents uh, are having because of poor housing or uh, unsecure housing in one form or another. Um, and uh, so, I mean, the cost is just almost immeasurable, both in terms of social impact, um, but as well as sort of say on public sector institutions, whether as Paul said, it's the NHS or whether it's the local authority itself. So I think we've taken a very clear commitment, which I think you'd all agree as, as, as a council, um, uh, that we must bring forward the building of new homes. We cannot stop doing that. We've tried to keep that rolling along over the course of the last eight years, and we intend to do that over the coming sort of, well, three years left of this administration anyway. Um, uh, and, and actually just picking up on two elements, if I may, Chair, one is the proposition around infill, where I think, you know, there is an absolute focus on finding those pieces of land. One day that land supply, of course, it is finite and it will run out and we'll have to think quite hard about where we go after that. But for the moment, it is there to deliver um, some 400 new homes um, sort of over the course of the coming four years or so, which is good, that is great. Um, uh, and equally though, we have all made that commitment um, that actually if refurbishment is um, what is required for um, perhaps for, for existing homes, rather than demolition, then it is refurbishment that we'll bring forward. But just to add to that, what has come about is that there are numbers of blocks of homes around the borough that the council currently owns, where actually more homes could be introduced into those blocks, which is not to do with demolition, but that requires refurbishment of those homes that are already within that block before those new homes are built. And I know that um, Council Joseph and Council Rapp, for example, are very familiar with one of those examples uh, in, in, in the ward that they're representing, where there is a real need for some very, very intense refurbishment um, into the existing homes before we start talking about adding additional homes to that particular community in that particular block. Um, so there are great challenges there, but it's still always that thinking about, okay, refurbishment first, then if that really structurally is just not possible, um, then only then would that demolition proposition come forward and that process commence. But the principle of building new homes, um, we're still very, very much focused, as, you, as, as I know you're aware, as a political administration in delivering and bringing forward new homes for residents um, uh, going forward. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson, and I know as well, she keep everybody happy, including Professor Watts, teeny bit of demolition on King's Crescent, a lot of refurbishment and increases in social housing, so there you go. Um, Councillor Joseph, Councillor Garbett, and then Councillor Root in that order. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you to all of our guests this evening. Um, so I'm actually going to go back to touch a little bit on what our chair um, was saying there about the split households. Um, my question essentially is what can be done to ensure that promises made to residents at the start are upheld sometimes 20 or 30 years later. So um, I acknowledge that we've got a charter, which I think is a great thing, and it promises that people will have a named officer which is fantastic, but obviously over a period of 20, 30 years, people get new jobs. So I don't know if you've got any figures for say how many officers have worked on the Woodbury Down scheme, but I imagine it, it'd be quite a lot. <laughs> and the same for Colville. And um, what we found in our residence focus group, actually, um, which I think the chair was kind of alluding to, was someone who was told at the beginning, you and your daughter are going to have a split household. And she's been hanging on to that for years. And now an officer said, oh, first I've heard of it. So that's changed. Um, so it's in terms of the outcome, what you're promised, but also 
uh, the time taken for the regeneration. So we heard from some people in the resident focus group who kind of like said, yeah, I was supportive um, when I kind of understood it was going to be done in about four or five years. My son was a baby. This lady's baby is now 23 years old and they still haven't moved into the new flat. So those were the main issues that were kind of coming out for me. Um, so I wonder, a uh, question for you yourselves, um, would you consider something like a contract, almost like a tenancy agreement put in place at the start of the regeneration, um, something quite binding and specific about what that person is going to get? Because obviously with the churn of offices over time, it can really kind of bend. Um, and, and just for Paul, um, or Dr. Watt, if you wouldn't mind picking up on this point too, um, in terms of the resident engagement over time, um, I think most of your research has been on Woodbury Down. How has that changed over time? And have the promises on Woodbury Down changed over time? So what residents were initially sort of like guaranteed, did that in your experience change? I hope that's clear. I've kind of brought in quite a few points there. <laughs> I'll start off. Um, so, question about the um, kind of commitment or kind of, I guess, charter or contract. So, we now do have a residence charter that um, was approved by Cabinet, and that does set out some key commitments for all of the Regen projects or the Hackney's building projects. Um, so, that's a good starting point. Um, we did, we have had bespoke residence charters for specific, so for specific Regen projects. So. Um, Tower Court had one, um, uh, Colville had one, which, which sets out those, those kind of commitments on an estate basis. Um, so um, that already does happen. Um, I appreciate that it's really tricky when we've got some really long-term regen projects, which are going over, you know, sometimes decades, to have a continuity of staff. I mean, it's almost impossible to expect someone to stay in a job for 20 years or 10 years even. Um, but what we're trying to do um, at the moment is we're re-looking at the structure of our team at the moment um, to try and, um, so what we're doing is we're taking a more area-based approach. So we're moving to a structure where we have um, uh, neighbourhood-based teams rather. So we, we have a project team that works in a particular area. So for instance, we'll have a, um, a, a Clapton Park um, team that oversees all the projects that are happening in that area so that they have so there'll be a group of officers who become very um knowledgeable and involved about a particular area and have that real understanding of the very local issues and very and, and build up that relationship both with residents and councillors um so that's something we're trying to do to to have that to sort of create more continuity and more kind of ownership at a kind of neighborhood level does that answer your question I mean, it sounds it sounds good, um, but would we consider a contract like something more set in stone, legally binding for the person to have the confidence yeah. that if this takes 20 years, I'm still going to get A, B and C at yeah, the end, maybe? Yeah, I think maybe. what you're talking about is a charter, um, mm. essentially, which would need to, a form of charter, um, whether that's, uh, if, if it captures anything that's not captured in our, in our residence charter, which is council-wide, something outside of that, then that would be a charter that needs to be at a, a state level so yeah really consider that for sure yeah. and i ask another one is it really cheeky it's just yeah. a quick follow-up yeah. just in terms of the length of time when residents are told yeah. how long um this is going to take five years what what is that based on because a, a lot of our residents that we spoke to basically they always said it was took a lot longer yeah it's so really how it, do is, we... it is really challenging and and um we do try really hard to um, to produce or develop realistic but ambitious programs um, for for our projects. Um, but these are really complex projects um, in a really, well, particularly at the moment, in a really difficult market, um, and um, with all sorts of risks and, and variables that we're sort of managing. And um, so they do sometimes slip. Um, and particularly recently when we've had these challenges with viability because of the construction market and the cost of building at the moment, um, it's been a really challenging time and that has caused us to, the projects to basically the length to extend and that is really frustrating for everybody, for us and for residents. Um, but we, we do try to do our best to communicate with 
um, residents about the, the time frames. Um, uh, but also, it's worth saying that doing regeneration well does take a long time. Like, you know, it's that process of, um, of understanding a place, working with residents, um, the design process. We might we probably take longer to design our schemes than say a developer, excuse me, uh, like a developer or a house builder would, because we we're really invested in getting the design right, and um, and that does take a bit longer. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Chair. I mean, thank you, Councillor Joseph. I think and there's another really good example, which um, I, I'm looking to Councillor Sackett now because it's actually uh, in King's Park Ward in Daubeny and the new homes that have uh, are now complete, and there are residents in those new homes. Um, but the new homes that were built, and of course that, oh, admittedly, yeah, okay, it all kind of overlapped with COVID and lockdowns and all manner of things. But what you're describing, Councillor Joseph, I think, was exactly one of those moments, even with those exceptional circumstances that came into play. What it meant was that suddenly a home that was supposed to be being delivered wasn't delivered until three years later, basically. And um, for all sorts of reasons that we're all very familiar with um, over that period of time. And that is incredibly frustrating because of course those residents were waiting for those homes. And the, the way that that was managed by the council, it goes back to that commitment to building a relationship with with those residents um, and making sure that that relationship, as I said earlier, is resourced and and that um, um, and is delivered on and just keeping that relationship in place because without it, um, I think you're absolutely right. It leads to a great deal of frustration. Um, but sorry, I know that doesn't respond to your kind of point about charters or contracts or whatever, but it's it's just another kind of experience, I think, that the council has been through uh, and actually has taken a great deal of learning from that experience. Um, and, and, and that was just a good example. And I think those residents are reasonably content now. <laughs> Councillor Sadek, I'm looking to you. Very <laughs> thanks. Oh, <yeah. laughs> Uh, Professor Watts, yeah, without going into too much of the ancient history to this, um, the, the, the prehistory to Woodbury Down was that this was an ex-GLC estate. When Heseltown was at the Department of Environment back in the early 80s, he forced through the transfer of uh, dozens of, ex of GLC estates into Labour councils. And, and Hackney didn't, you know, I think many of the councils at the time, they were all Labour councils, they didn't really want the GLC estates because they were already struggling to maintain the existing estates, basically. The backdrop to Woodbury Down was it was 150, it was estimated that by the end of the 90s, it was about 150 million pounds worth of backlog maintenance. Also, 31 of the homes were structurally prob problematic. But, sorry, 31 of the blocks, of the 57 blocks. But it, and this is a bit like taking coals to Newcastle, I'm afraid. But I, I'm just going to read you out what Hackney Council, what its four original aims were. This, I'm taking this from the Cabinet Minutes back in 2002. First, realising a substantial capital receipt for the Woodbury Down School site. Secondly, achieving a substantial part of its decent homes target, because Woodbury Down is 10% of the council's housing stock. Thirdly, providing additional social housing, which will then mean that you can rehouse homeless families. Fourth, achieving corresponding services in temporary accommodation for the homeless. Now, the first one of those might have been achieved, but the other three clearly haven't, because there will be net reduction, about 20%, 15, 20% net reduction. The amount of social housing will be down whenever it's finished, 35, it's still, still around. Um, recent homes, what happened there was that when will be down was put into the regeneration scheme it was taken out of decent homes program and this was pretty commonplace in many of the state regeneration estates that i looked at so essentially what this meant was that tenants in regeneration estates were actually living in worse condition homes because they weren't getting the decent homes and what happened then was there's a whole series of tenants protesting about the fact that their windows kitchens bathrooms were falling to bits and eventually then Hackney council then did finally 2016 17 whatever uh come around then to actually do the decent homes because i interviewed people who are actually having the decent homes work in 2017. 
Also, at one point, it was noted that there would be a community-based housing association. That never happened. It was, it was Genesis came in. So what's happened, if you trace through, there's been a whole series of changes of, of more. And the original aims, I think in many ways, were very laudable. Particularly if you're going to say, okay, we're going to increase the amount of social housing. Clearly that's not happened. And clearly the whole process is taking way, way longer than I think anybody envisaged back when this thing was kicked off in, well, early 2000s. Okay, thank you. Does it answer your question, Councillor Joseph? So the potential for a charter, but that will be subject to change given the kind of different factors that implement de affect developments over the long term. Thank you. Um, Councillor Garbutt. Hi, thank you so much for this. It's really insightful. Um, I just had a question that kind of picks up on some of the comments that have been spoken about so far and things we heard in the engagement, which is just around um people being able to engage so we heard a lot about people having to read lots of kind of complicated long heavy reports to be able to participate and um, so just wondered how that's managed in terms of how we reach kind of a wide diverse group of people to be able to feed in and it links to in the slides that i thought were really helpful um it mentions residents taking a leading role and i just wondered if that was on their terms and what that looks like and how that works in practice. I know we've heard some really great stuff from Woodbury Down, but I just wondered, yeah, what that looked like and the commitment kind of going forward on that. Thank you. So we do go to huge efforts to um, make sure that the, we, the way we communicate with residents throughout engagement process is really clear and easy to understand and it's in plain english um it's um it, they don't get huge sort of reports which are really technical or unreadable or boring or sort of um full of jargon um we work with our communications team to um to do that so we've got um a lot of work has gone in over the years and we i think we've become better at doing that we've learned um we've got some kind of really good examples where we've um the way we present information is is very clear um and often quite sort of graphic but not kind of difficult to read architectural plans um and um clear language um and um, we also um, have officers um, and architects in person at um, when we do design workshops to explain to residents if they don't understand something and um, talk through designs um, and um, offer that opportunity um, for instance for people who don't necessarily want to um, sort of read through everything they'll give them they'll give them a summary if, if needs be so I think just in summary we, we do Put a huge amount of effort. I think we've we've learned over the years. We sort of developed a, a style of communication which is, I think, really clear, and, and that's that there's consistency across everything. Um, all of the projects we we have a similar format, um, and um, you know we really want to make sure it's accessible. So um, we also offer translators for people who whose English is not their first language. We have um, depending on where we're working. So King's Crescent, for instance, we always have a Turkish translator do Turkish um, versions of our of our information. Um, so yeah, we 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 put a lot of work into into doing that. And it's really important. Um, and the last thing we want is um, for a resident to come into a room and feel intimidated by a load of information that's really hard to understand. Um, Sorry, what was the second question? Thanks, that was really helpful. The um, second question is about the comment on the slide that says that the approach you take is, it allows residents to take a leading yes. role. And I just wondered if that was kind of on their terms and how much they are able to lead. Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah, we, I have heard examples from um, Wilbury Town, but yeah, just what that looks like and what the commitment is around that. Yeah, I think, um, uh regeneration steering groups are, are really key in that so like woodco on woodby down we have a number of those on um the project where we're delivering directly so for instance Cetra on the colville estate um uh is is an example of one of those where you know there's a huge huge involvement and very much um a leading role we also 
Um, for instance, um, we try to um, ensure that um, steering groups see the material before it's presented to the wider estate um, so that they can input and, and they can have that kind of judgment, give it a kind of a review. It, is it accessible? Is it doing the right thing? Um, so I would say the role of steering groups in particular is really important in taking that leading role and that relationship that we have as officers with that steering group. Um, did you want to add anything? Um, sorry, Chair, I mean, not really. I mean, I think, I think that if, if that kind of sort of resonates, Councillor Gabbard, then, then the from a regeneration steering group and then sort of, if you like, disseminating down through that kind of workshop approach, um, very much maybe day long workshops, workshops, drop ins and so on and so forth, combined with that communications led approach, um, which is sort of very customized to that particular estate or community or project or scheme or whatever it may be, however large or small. All of that plays back in a very positive way in terms of um, ensuring that a people understand they understand the context in very very good time and they have the opportunity to feed into that um, context too, i.e., the design of something, for example. When it gets to that delivery stage, so suddenly there is construction happening, there is noise, there is a lot of digging going on, there is a lot of building going on, and so on and so forth. That relationship is equally as crucial at that point in just managing that impact and mitigating the, the if you like, the downside of development. Um, and um, uh, when you get through to that point. So building that relationship is as crucial at the very beginning, at the outset, um, and then going through the design phases, as Rachel was saying, but it becomes even more critical when the actual construction is going on itself, when it's suddenly the physicality of it all starts to actually happen on the ground. Sorry, thanks. I should also add that um, we involve residents in, um, particularly, we're well, usually steering group um, members in the selection of architects, um, in um, the selection of contractors. They're involved in that process, in the procurement process, and they help us to review bids. Um, and we've also, on some, so in some instances, we've taken um, groups of residents around schemes that either we've delivered, as an example of, of the kind of work that we do, or, or other schemes outside of our, um, as sort of to try and sort of show the example of the kind of, of sort of new build schemes. So um, I just want to add that. Thank you very much. Answered, com yeah, comprehensively. Um, Councillor Roots. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm going to try and roll two thoughts into, into one in a way. Um, it seems to me great that we've got some good practice on engagement emerging from some of our long-term projects like Woodbury Down and Colville. Um, but I'm a bit concerned that they are very large projects and what we're looking at in the future is a lot more smaller projects. You mentioned the 15 new build sites. That's all, all of them are much smaller. Um, we just, we're trying not to demolish as much. So therefore, it seems to me quite likely that we're going to be looking at much smaller regen projects in the future, which I think is right. But I do wonder if some of the things which you are able to offer in terms of reg re resident engagement on those bigger projects are applicable on smaller ones and how therefore you can take some of the learning that you've got from those bigger projects and scale down to smaller projects. So I'll give you some examples. The kinds of thing I'm thinking about are uh, steering groups are great if you've got enough interested and engaged residents to be part of a steering group. I can think of one estate where there is some significant regeneration going on, but the TRA is not particularly engaged and I think you'd find it hard to actually get a steering group together and even if you were to get a steering group together what we found from the focus group evidence was that a lot of individuals take on a huge amount of work for free and sometimes it goes on over many years and they end up suffering from burnout and they get very tired but they also become 
quite guilty if they try to drop the work because they feel they're not just letting themselves down, but they're letting down their whole, all their neighbors and, and the community. So I'd like you to think about what kinds of support we might be able to give individuals who do want to become actively involved in resident engagement on Regen going forward, because I think it's frankly not fair to impose upon individuals to the degree that we have done in the past. Um, and whilst we've got some support mechanisms, as I say, in, in, in place in Colville and Woodbury Down, I don't think that sort of support is going to be possible on the smaller ones. So we need to, we need to be imaginative and think about other ways to support those people, I think. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about related to this is, is about information. I completely agree with Professor Watt about um, the need to rebuild trust. Um, it's, it's ongoing and the role of housing officers on estates is crucial in that. Um, and I think that we need to find a way of beefing up their role so that those housing officers are properly informed about what's happening with regeneration so that they can keep their residents up to date. I don't think that happens at the moment. I think that lots of housing officers don't really understand what's going on with the regen. That's, um, so, and, and I also think we need to look at how, if we're building trust, how those housing officers are able to communicate across different departments when they need to. Um, which we're very poor at at the moment. There's way too much silo thinking. Um, and finally, on that thought, I suppose, um, Rachel mentioned that uh, when it comes to communicating changes and what have you, you do your best to communicate. Um, I would say that actually that's not good enough with all, good, all due respect. I think we need regular and reliable communications as part of any regeneration scheme. And Councillor Nicholson will know of a recent example uh, where we went to a TRA meeting um, and that was the first moment at which residents on that estate had found out that the regeneration plans that they'd been talking about for the last three years had changed significantly. It's not really appropriate to be announcing that sort of change to residents in a TRA meeting. There's a handful of people there. It ends up being kind of word of mouth Chinese whispers that goes out onto the estate. People should have that information communicated properly to them with a regular newsletter. So I think that looking at regular and reliable comms in any of these big and small regen projects is really important. And I'd love to hear all three of your comments on any of that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, Ozan has to leave fairly soon. It's okay for him to. You have an add on to like Council some, Root. Uh, what Penny said, and then we should see the reliable communication. And also, it would be really good to get the housing officers informed about the regeneration. Also, uh, I don't think there are not many residents uh, comes to a workshop or server. So, uh, I think if they don't come to us, our housing officers can go there and they can inform them. That would be another good idea. Thank you. If they don't come to us, we go to them. We should go to them. Yeah, that's, that's the very direct communication. Thank you. Yeah. Um, some really good points in there. Um, I think you're, you've absolutely picked up on one of the big challenges we've got as we move away from these big estate region projects where we're doing having this very long-term relationship with residents yeah. and all of those people are ultimately getting a new home out of the process and we're moving more towards building on um, underused plots of land within estates. Um, how do we engage with people through that process? How can we give something back to people who are going to be disrupted by the building, by... Um, you know, there'll be more people moving into the area. How do we both engage people and um, make them feel like there's something for them in the process? And I think that's a really real challenge. Um, and, you know, one thing that is really important in the way that we work on these um, these projects, which are, I guess it's a form of infill, is um, that we we don't just build, we're not just going in there building housing on within the red line boundary. We're very much looking at uh, 
the public realm that surrounds the, the site and, and the sort of wider transformation of that housing can have. Um, and that's an example, for instance, on De Beauvoir, where that's very much happening. It's about um, creating new streets through the process or new um, green spaces or new um, planting new trees, um, new play areas. Um, so that residents who aren't going to get a new home and are just going to be sort of disrupted by building works are going to see a benefit. Um, and um, but how you engage uh, residents in, in that process, which is shorter in its time frame, but still demanding in 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 asking of their time is is a, is is a challenge. And I think your question about how we could be creative about offering support is a good one. And I think that's something for me to take away. And and I think it's a you know how can we as the council support people better to be engaged to give their time up um, in that process? I don't have an answer, but I think it's a good question. Um, and then the point about housing officer, absolutely true um really important role and it'd be i really like it if we could get housing officers more engaged in the region work that we're doing um and i completely agree with that um so that's that was my sort of input and if you know, have any dad councillor nicholson no th thank you chair i mean uh, and thank you councillor i mean i think the the point if i may just dwell on that last point that rachel finished on in other words that's um relationship between let's call it regeneration and housing management and how it works how it kind of comes together so that suddenly what we're not just talking about as you were rightly identifying um is um, um however frequently or infrequently we may be talking about it but nevertheless that where we're looking at a smaller development going on within a wider estate that what we're not doing is just ignoring everything else that's going on on the estate and that we're not taking advantage of an opportunity to be able to enhance and improve the wider estate environment for example the wider estate infrastructure and and really start sort of kind of capitalizing i think rachel you you, you mentioned it um on on the fact that really what we're talking about at estates are neighborhoods their places their places where people can live and do other things as well and and do them in a great environment and and uh, and and thrive and prosper as a result so with that kind of set of principles in place that blend of housing management and housing regeneration is really important and and i think that perhaps anything that the commission chair may wish to kind of sort of emphasize some of that thinking i think would be really quite valuable for the council actually and i think very helpful indeed but obviously i don't want to stray too much into the portfolio of councillor mckenzie um, who really should be here to kind of respond to that sort of proposition that i've just sort of put on the table and indeed you have tabled as well but i think that's well said thank you chair thank you very much um i'm going to do a question now it's sort of following on from councillor root in respect of engagement and um, potentially also one for professor watt we know across our borough there are people more likely to engage with our systems and processes in certain groups um contrary to the experience of others so particularly in terms of our young people people from the global majority and black residents in terms of our bigger projects are we assessing that kind of engagement with these groups is demographic information available as a means of ensuring that as wide a possible view as many viewpoints as possible are incorporated into the work that we're doing um and then add on to that as well in terms of the mayor of london's good practice guide i see that we have a whole host of communication tools that were utilized at the moment specifically for our residents but he also makes a call for extending that to people who live immediately neighboring our developments as well as ultimately they are impacted i'd like to know whether we are engaging on that sort of level as yet or whether that's something we're going to incorporate into our work moving forwards um yeah let's well, go for the second question first um uh yeah we um it, on every time we um look at sort of engaging with a on a, on a project we sort of look very carefully about uh, who's going to be the sort of reach of the engagement and that is very much um tailored to the specific project and and who as you say who's going to be impacted it's not just about 
um, drawing a line and saying if you live in within this estate technically you get you're part of the engagement but if you don't you're not going to be um, consulted or engaged with so um, which is the right thing to do um, and the first question um, sorry can you just re rephrase just remind me the gist of the first question the extent of enabling as many people from as many diverse groups yes. as possible particularly young people people from the global majority as well in our processes yeah. often they're not they're not active participants in what we do we know this is across yeah. the board um so how active are we in ensuring that that's reflect their voices are reflected in what we're doing and are we monitoring that and possibly potentially doing outreach activities as well yeah we we are always trying to find ways to get more people involved and better representation from all groups um in our engagement um events and our engagement processes um and um but i think uh we could certainly improve on that i think what we don't do is we haven't got we haven't monitored who is actually attending our i haven't got statistics on on the um the makeup of the people who actually who have engaged i think that's a really good point um and that's something i can take take away from here and look at doing because i think that would be a really valuable exercise I don't know whether Professor Watt's done any kind of research into that. Who's more likely to engage with these processes? Has he got a view on that or no? Uh, it's very interesting because in relationship to some of the states that I looked at, um, it was actually the threat of demolition that got people engaged in the neighbourhood and the community. It was, it was one of the kind of like the ironic byproducts of demolition is that once people kind of like said and actually they get they get this notice through the door that their homes can be evicted actually that did sort of gen ironically it did generate uh, a certain amount of uh, you know neighborhood conviviality as a result of that it's one of the big ironies of it okay so if we tell them we're going to end up them down a load of people from a lot more groups become involved or exercise as a as opposed to refurbishments and infill projects okay that's helpful to know um but again um on top of that as well, sorry, it's just an add-on of my own, longevity of engagement as well. So there's a sense that potentially some organisations, when they talk about youth engagement, it's, it's a trip here and there to a youth centre or a youth, as opposed to that long-term narrative um, developing alongside them and, and the authority. Is that something, again, that's been factored into the work that we're doing across the board in respective areas? So ensuring that they're brought along with us as active participants in the long haul, as opposed to these kind of stop and starts approach. So every now and then popping in saying, oh, this is what we're doing. You know, what are your views on this? And then going back a year later. So is, is that a consideration that's been taken as well? I mean, we, we do try to um, engage with young people, um, particularly that's one of the groups that we try to engage. I haven't written it to both while we there's a particular emphasis on that. Um, but I think we could do better and I think that's a really good point about um, having that long view about um, about those people who, on, on a long project that's taking a long time, you know, they're growing up on a region estate. You know, they're they're, they're not staying a, a teenager throughout that process or not staying a young person throughout that process. So having that long view I think is really important. Thank you. Any more questions? Councillor Joseph. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, coming out of our, our focus group of residents, um, most residents, as it says in the document, did have concerns about the change in social dynamics on the estates and about equitable access to estate facilities in terms of what ended up being built. Excuse me. So do you think that your charter could maybe go a little bit further and do anything to address that? For example, sort of saying, you know, you, you can't build a gym on a, on a Hackney estate without that being available for all kinds of tenures. Is that something that we could sort of consider? And I suppose um, just also handing over the baton to um, Professor Watt, um, I'd be interested in hearing your views um, on sort of balanced and integrated communities and whether or not that's something that you've observed being created in in some of these region estates ultimately are, are people mixing and are people actually able to all access what gets built because that's something that residents highlighted to us thank you um so 
we it's fundamental to what we do that we're we're designing and building um mixed and integrated communities we don't um we certainly uh, you know the scheme every uh, block and every um, home is tenure blind from the outside you, you won't you, I challenge you to walk into one of our estates that we've worked on and you can, shouldn't be able to tell what tenure each home is um we have um uh, we mix uh, tenure where possible um and um, we make sure there's an equality of access to new public realm and uh, new courtyards um there's absolutely you no know, corridors or any of that you know it's very much um it's a big sort of focus of what we do um so uh i just i think it's it's sort of a fundamental principle um but yeah we maybe it needs to be more explicit in the residence charter it's something we could we could set out but it's absolutely the, the, the case that that's how we how we work sorry Pete, was a question about social mixing on uh, on regenerative states yeah, how, how you do that yeah and it was okay. just whether or not you people uh, had integrated and whether yeah, or sure. not uh, you felt that everyone could access the amenities on the estate because I suppose what residents had expressed in terms of engagement was that you know they weren't necessarily always what what they'd led to, to expect at the beginning wasn't always how it ended up. So in terms of amenities and being able to use those, I mean, not to be the bearer of bad news, but I mean the 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 policy orthodoxy is that mixed tenure communities are good. The academic research tends to say that a lot of the claims that are made for a mixed tenure community simply don't, they, they don't realise for all kinds of reasons. Um, certainly you can have community development projects and Woodco is a good example of that and the Red Community Centre, you could say that they do all kinds of good projects and they put on fun days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also having tenure blind design, that's also important to try to create this sort of sense of you know, getting away from any us and them kind of things. But the realities of it, and again, if you think about London as a city, you're dealing with very, very different demographics. The demographics in social housing estates, high levels of people with disabilities, high levels with vulnerabilities, you have high levels of older people. On the private developments that are created as a result of regeneration of states, you tend to have the classic young professionals. The lifestyles are just widely different. In socioeconomic terms, they're chasmic. The incomes that you have to have to be able to rent or buy a property in Woodbury Down means that you're in an absolutely different social strata to your social rental neighbours next next to the next block. So, you know, the, 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 the sociological reality is that, you, you know, you, 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 you fight, you, it's, it's an uphill battle to try and create this sense of community. Plus, Barclay's own data shows that the mean length of tenancy in the private blocks at Woodbury Down is 23 months. So you've got a churn. That's very, very different from the people that I were interviewing in the social, uh, the social, but the originals council tenants who had lived there 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They were embedded. Plus the design, if you think, if you look at the design of the old blocks in Woodbury Down and compare those with the new blocks. The old blocks have got their faults, no doubt about it, but there was nevertheless an openness of porosity about it. And people got familiar with their neighbors because they could, because in order to get to your neighbor's uh, uh, front door, in order to be able to get to their front door, they had to pass through your kitchen window. So it was a constant set of flow in the old blocks, basically. And because people lived there over, year, over many years, they got to know, trust their neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing dramatic. There's nothing dramatic going on. It's simply longevity, familiarity, proximity. Now you don't have that in the new blocks because they're sealed off. You cannot get in the new blocks unless you know somebody in there. So what you've got is these islands which are sealed off. You can't get into them. And 
The LSE did a survey of private renters in the new Woodbury Down blocks. One third of all the private renters knew nobody whatsoever in the entire development. So the idea that private tenants in the new development, that large numbers of those people are going to be on friendly relations with people living near the blocks, the rental blocks, it, it, it's, it's really not going to happen. So yes, you can create some, I think we'll, be, we'll, we'll create just some great stuff, but the, 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 you know, the fundamentals of it, you're creating a very, very different space. And there's an interesting, I don't, I don't know if, if anybody's seen it, there was a very, very interesting film that was done which was based around uh, young uh, black and African residents who had grown up at Woodbury Down. And their sense from the film was that they no longer identified it as being their place. They felt excluded. They were actually involved in some of the part of the football team, but nevertheless, they felt that they weren't part of the new Woodbury Down. Their, 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 their social identity, if you like, within it was marginalised, basically. So I think there are all kinds of issues. I'm not saying it's hopeless, but I'm saying that you have to also at the same time recognise that there are these issues. And the way that the new blocks are designed, they're not greatly user-friendly. And again, we'll be down. We know that there's like the gym, the, pipe, the swimming pool. You can only use those if you're actually a private resident. They're not, they're not available to social tenants. So, with all the good world, social tenants are not exactly going to think, well, this, this place, those things are for me. Well, they're not. That's the reality of it. Thank you, Professor Watt. Councillor Nicholson, did you want to come in? It, just, it was just to kind of um, just to continue on from uh, something that Rachel was saying um, in response to Councillor Joseph, your, your, your point about access to infrastructure on council-led um, regeneration initiatives, basically. Um, now, there may be facilities or infrastructure or, or whatever. Um, and, and I think it kind of sort of sort of takes us back to where we started, actually, earlier this evening about co-production because the, and the real importance of having residents part of that process because for them to identify that something exclusive might be coming down the tracks for example in whatever shape or form it might be um it, that's where one would want that to be kind of tabled and hopefully changed because it's not something that the council would support um and certainly wouldn't want to enable um so in other words you know from a council perspective we would be looking at making sure that the council was delivering infrastructure that is accessible uh, and that is relevant and is affordable, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's something really important and very, very relevant to that co-production sort of set of values that Rachel was sort of really touching on. Um, sorry, I, I, that, that was it, Chair. Thank you very much. Brian, um, we are going to have to round things up here. Might have to be my question. It's, it's sort of following on from Claire's. Um, it was just respect of um, social cohesion. As Professor Watts highlighted, there's increasing mix in terms of social strata that didn't previously exist in our borough, but has been brought about as a result of our ongoing development and mixed tenure providing housing for everybody across the board. But within that, there's some people who feel a little disconnect, somewhat disconnected, um, who've been there permanently and seen developments grow beside them. In respect of the work that we're doing with regard to engagement, is there something, something put away in the pot to kind of support activities on a local level once these developments come into being in terms of community engagement? Yeah, essentially that's all I want to know. What, what can we do proactively to kind of solidify our communities post development? Is that part of the process that we have at the moment? Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, that's a very, very good question. And if I may suggest, that is probably a question that's best placed with tenant participation and the team in housing services, and perhaps asking them to come along and present to that, because there has to come a point where the regeneration bit and the regeneration conversation and the co-production and all of the relationships that are built around that 
I think, as you rightly point out, then need to kind of sort of, in effect, morph into that more established set of relationships, which are to do with a group of residents who are living their lives and doing whatever it is that they may be doing in their lives within said place, within said estate, within said community. And that then takes one very, very clearly out of the regeneration sphere and into the housing kind of management, the housing services sphere, the business of tenant and resident participation post regeneration. I think it's a really crucial transition to get right. I think you're absolutely spot on. And I'm sure that we're all seeing this playing out in um, actually those states that have not undergone any regeneration at all. Um, and I don't want to kind of extend the proceedings and expand things out too far, but um, you know, we're already seeing many different tenure types appearing on, on, on council estates, not because of what the council is building, but because of wider macro and national policies. And, um, uh, and I would suggest that in itself is already challenging the council in making sure that actually the relationships between these various different, um, so let's call them groups of residents, is something that is um, constructive, that is enabled and facilitated. Um, but I, I think I would say it perhaps goes a little bit beyond the remit of the regeneration team itself. Um, but the regeneration team, of course, is sort of looking at sort of establishing relationships. So I think perhaps the question might be best placed to resident participation about how they then embrace that and take it forward to the next step. Yes, I'm posting Councillor Pallis, I believe you have a follow-up. Yes, I just wanted to um, put something in the mix. Um, the, the narrative obviously that Professor Watts has put forward is um, that the regeneration that Hackney has undertaken um, has been the prime kind of uh, engine behind what is considered to be gentrification. Gentrification is obviously a term that started in Islington in 1964 uh, and, uh, and a lot of people who were in Islington came to Hackney in the 1970s and the 1980s um, and you know we saw lots of different uh, community projects like Centerprise come out of that uh, uh, you know moments of, of, of solidarity. I think there is also a real issue around key workers um, and key workers not afford you know being able to live in you know the borough because rent is so high that is why we do need rent control we'll welcome you know our calls for that and obviously the, the mayor of london but i just wanted to just get an understanding of what are we doing around supporting key workers in in our on our projects going forward because they've got to be a key part of of, of hackney uh, and currently they can't you know, often afford rents. I've got friends who are doctors who can't afford to, to live in Hackney and how are we bring them into this picture. Thank you, Councillor Pallis. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, uh, and Rachel, please do come in here. But I mean, just in summary, uh, from a Hackney Council perspective, from our administration's perspective, Councillor Pallis, I think what you're describing is the Hackney Living Rent model. That is that product, if I can describe it as that, that is affordable to those key workers who need those homes and ideally need those homes within, within Hackney, within our community, because they're serving our community one way or another. Um, and I think that the Hackney Living Rent model um, uh, which is based on household income um, and a percentage of market rent and so on and so forth, which is more than social rent. It is not the same level as council rents, basically. It is slightly higher than that, but it is well below market. Now, Rachel, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, we've um, we've recently completed sixteen um, homes, uh, which were hidden homes within Gooch House on Crouch. I don't know whether you know that scheme, and that was specific, we specifically um, engaged with key workers at Homerton Hospital um, through the design process of those homes. They were um, and they were very popular, huge um, demand for those. We had to sort of do a ballot for 
allocating them um, and they're sort of been very popular and um, it's something that we'd like to um, replicate in other uh, play, on other schemes. Is that Professor Watts microphone? Yes. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't um, say that gentrification is just a product of uh, you know the last uh, few in regenerations. Clearly, it's been around since the sixties. But what we've got is clearly with estate regeneration, demolition, and rebuild schemes like we'll be down. It's a step change. It's basically state-led gentrification. There's a total transformation of the area in a way that, you know, it was much more evolutionary, gradual than many of the other earlier phases of regeneration. To say about, I just want to say one thing about the issue about inclusion and exclusion. I spent a bit of time in the last few weeks looking at uh, some of the, how, the way that housing developers sell their homes. Uh, what they actually, how do they sell their homes? The way they sell their homes in London is basically around safety, security, uh, connectivity, that's the way that they sell it. It's a particular marketing technique. Now, within that sales technique, then, you have to think about who is the, who is the problematic other to that technique. The problematic other to that technique, and that's what the Woodbury Down film that I mentioned about the young people showed, was that they, local youth, particularly local black youth, they then are problematized by the way that those uh, uh, the way that the discourse around the sales of these new homes operates because they then are perceived as being threatening etc cetera, etc cetera. so to me i think and this is i'm doing kind of a new, a new project looking at social mixing in some of the states but i think issues in particular around youth and how young people are included or excluded in relationship to the way that these new estates manage their process security. My suspicion is that part of this, this securitization process is that it is uh, you know, exclusionary, particularly against local black youth. But that's a hypothesis which I'll try and test out. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. So what? I'm glad to see we have a commitment in terms of engaging with our young people and global majority and black residents on regeneration estates given here today to counter that. Um, and there we have to bring things to a, a close in terms of this segment of the meeting. So I'd like to thank Guy, Councillor Guy Nicholson, Professor Watt, uh, Rachel Benigal, Baginel, sorry, and Hermione Brightwell alongside Steve Webster, um, Chair of Hackney's Resident and Liaison, Liaison Group, alongside, we're not finished yet though, my colleagues for the fabulous questions they put forward this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should have added, yeah. We will reflect on the evidence you gave here today and we'll be putting forward some kind of comments and suggestions in terms of assisting you with the ongoing work that you're doing. I hope that will be appreciated. Thank you. And thank you very much, Professor Watt. We may be in touch, get some of your research. Okay, moving on to agenda item five. Um, minutes of the meeting, draft minutes of the previous meeting held on the 22nd of march are included with the agenda pack for members to agree oh, wow three oh. <laughs> palace fabulous all the docs were in the right place all done well <laughs> okay Moving on, uh, Living in Hackney Work Programme 22-23. Um, that's included within the, within the agenda pack. But within that, I'd also like just to thank members for their hard work over the course of the past year. We've tackled some kind of complex and overarching themes um, within which there's been a lot of kind of substantive information and data to deal with. And I think you've done an amazing job in terms of holding people to account, putting forward suggestions and ideas and proposals and undertaking effective scrutiny, which is what we're here for. Um, for from social landlords, um, to the implement, implementation of the Charter of Social Housing for Residents, uh, tenancy sustainment repairs, complaints and safety and resident engagement. Um, 
We'll be looking to finalise our findings and recommendations for these pieces of work over the coming weeks. Um, that being said, we've also looked at the partnership approach to policing of drug use in Hackney, and in particular how effective it's been and how consistently it's been used across our communities and the impact it's had on residents. Um, we've reviewed the progress of the council and its partners in advancing equality, diversion, and inclusion in the arts and cultural sectors. And we brought together a number of stakeholders to understand their views and perspectives. Um, you know, I think we hope that we've contributed in some way to wider discussions and debates in terms of the work that we've been doing across the board. Um, yeah, fantastic. Uh, but having said that, we do have one more meeting to come next week, and that's the ongoing scrutiny of the coordinated partnership response to concerns raised by the child Q incident around safeguarding policies and practice, organisational cultures, adultification, trust and confidence and community engagement, which will take on board both safeguarded from the children and young people's perspective, as well as the approach from police. And I hope to see as many of you there as possible. Uh, oh, go ahead, Councillor Root. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of myself and probably the, all the other members, um, a big thank you for you for chairing incredibly effectively over the last year. And, and to our Vice Chair as well, who's also stood in very effectively. And um, also mention to Craig, who I think has done some really fantastic yeah. support work. Yeah. Enough. Yeah, and I think we set some trends in terms of resident engagement as well and participation, which I think we should be proud of, particularly Claire, who's undertook Councillor Jodie who undertook a lot of the background work in order to bring that about. Um, so that was the AOB. I'm assuming there is no other business. Thank you very much. I've therefore declared this meeting closed. <laughs>